I grew up in the home of doctors, amidst a close community of scientists of various types. Physicians, engineers, chemists, computer scientists. With phenomenal role models like my 95-year-old grandma, who was a PhD zoology professor in post-independence India, it would seem a foregone conclusion that I too would become a scientist. I chose to become an emergency physician, but I often feel emergency medicine chose me. I also grew up in the home of a self-taught artist whose images and perspectives pervaded our physical space. In his midlife, my father sought out his first formal art education by taking lessons with Edward Loper, an acclaimed local African-American artist who was widely known for his bold use of color. Ed Loper was an anomaly himself. Born in 1916, his paintings hung in some institutions before African-Americans themselves were allowed in. He and his art taught me how to see layers to understand meaning. Ed Loper taught me how to view a painting. Priya, he said, let the image fill your view. Take it all in. Let your eyes wander across the canvas in any way they're driven. And then take a step closer. And another. And a step closer still, until you're as close to the canvas as you can possibly get. Take in all the textures and lines that come together to form the parts of the painting. To understand how a complex play of color can bring together the depth and meaning to convey a story. And then take a giant step back and see how the painting fits in its space. How does it add or detract from the world around it? Does the message or meaning change? This has become a sentinel paradigm of how I view the world. Let me tell you a story about a woman I'll call Miss May. I met Miss May on a busy Thursday afternoon in the emergency department when her primary care physician sent her in for evaluation of a headache and high blood pressure. On arrival, Miss May's blood pressure was 223 over 114, exceptionally high. She lay on a stretcher, uncomfortable, but not in agony, and was easily answering all my questions. She had had a headache. It was ongoing for days, and familiar to her as one that reminded her, that told her that she, her blood pressure was elevated. She had not taken her blood pressure medicines that day. She had not taken anything for a headache. As an emergency physician, I know she's at risk for a head bleed, a heart attack, heart failure, or kidney failure. But overall, clinically, she looked pretty good. And her tests confirmed this. She just hadn't taken her meds. She thought going to her doctor would make it better. Her doctor felt like she needed a higher level of care, and so sent her to me. As an emergency physician, I have the skills and resources to immediately determine if she's an imminent threat to life or limb. But what if we take some steps closer? Miss May hadn't taken her blood pressure medicines because she ran out. She ran out because the mail delivery service her insurance company made her use didn't send her supply in time. She called her doctor's office and was told she needed to make an appointment, but the earliest appointment was still two weeks away. She went to an urgent care center to address her headache and was given a dose of Tylenol and a two-week prescription for her medications. She took this prescription to the pharmacy and was told that her insurance company denied it because she was supposed to get everything through mail order. The time finally came for Miss May to go to her regular doctor, and she was sent to me instead. She smiled weakly at me and said, I was trying to stay out of the ER, 
but it seems you guys are the only ones who can help me. And what if we take a step back? Miss May is a middle-aged African-American woman. She emigrated from Liberia as a refugee during a time of civil war and genocide in her country. She lives in South Philly, has a primary care physician, meets criteria for obesity, and has chronic disease. Her story begets more questions. How many people are just like Miss May, who come to the emergency department because someone sends them in, who have doctors and resources, but have a question or a need that can't be addressed in a timely manner? How about people who don't have a doctor, don't have insurance? Where are they supposed to go in times of need? How about other people like hourly wage workers, those who are caregivers to others, those who can't easily make an appointment during the traditional work week. Emergency departments exist at the interface of the hospital system and the communities they serve. By their very nature, emergency departments are universally accessible to anyone who needs us or wants us. Further, we're the only part of the health system that's purely user-triggered. We will see anybody, regardless of ability to pay, or regardless of nature of emergency. For everybody else, you must prove yourself before you walk through the door. Do you have insurance? Can you pay? Can you call when the office is open? Can you wait for an appointment? Emergency departments have a unique perspective on the needs of the communities they serve. When I look at the emergency department, much like I do a painting, I see a cross section of society <coughs> and a broad range of need. All of my senses take in the stimuli around me to create a picture of the population I serve. As I take steps closer, the individuals come into focus. Their, their complaints and presentations, their diagnostic needs, their questions, and the fear and uncertainty they can't articulate. Closer still, and I see all the reasons that brought them to my doors, none of which are disease-specific, but all of which will have an impact on the plan I put in place. How they eat, sleep, work, and play, these are the social determinants of health. But what if I take a step back? My emergency department st sits in a specific part of Philadelphia, a city of neighborhoods. What about the other emergency departments in the city? Each are a reflection of the neighborhoods in which they reside and the communities they serve. Together, this mosaic of emergency departments creates a picture of the populace that may be missing from the medical system at large. People like Miss May, thousands over my career, have made me wonder, does anyone see what I see? I and my colleagues in the emergency department work to be accessible to those most in need and during times of greatest stress. We are driven to fill in the gaps and create the safety net to foster survival and a second chance. We see on a daily basis what most could never fathom. But honestly, what has affected me the most are example after example of systemic inequality of disparities of gender, race, income status on my patients and their world. I am an impatient doer. It is a character trait or flaw of most of my brethren in the emergency department. When it became clear that the stories of Miss May were not being heard on higher levels, I became acutely aware of my greater responsibility. This has driven me to expand my efforts outside of the walls of the emergency department. How could I use the lessons that I've learned in the emergency department to increase health equity? How could I show others the phenomenal potential of capitalizing on the reach and access of the emergency department 
to help impact the health of a community. How could I make the emergency department a tool of social justice? The opioid epidemic is the public health crisis of our time. The numbers are staggering. I live and work in Philadelphia that has the highest overdose rate of any large city in the country, with more than 1,200 deaths in 2017 alone. But behind the graphs and the numbers and the statistics are people. Husbands and wives, someone's child, my neighbors. I have pulled them blue and lifeless from cars. I have watched their suffering from the chronic disease that is addiction. I have tried to engage them when their fear has prevented them from even being able to look me in the eye. And I have watched the anguish of those who love them not know how to help anymore. In 2012, I was part of a group of emergency physicians that recognized the important role of emergency departments in the face of the epidemic. We led the charge and made a concerted effort to not only limit our role in the problem, but to work to save lives beyond the emergency department. This grassroots effort started initially with safe opioid prescribing, which in effect decreased the number of prescriptions from the emergency departments in my system by nearly 70%. I and other physician champions across the city became leaders in overdose prevention, in increased access to ongoing care, far ahead of most city and regional efforts to do the same. Emergency physicians are pragmatic problem solvers. And here was another example of each of us working to, to address a problem we saw in our midst. We adapted to the needs of our community far quicker than the systems around us and worked to make our interventions relevant to our patients and communities. We illustrated a lesson. Emergency departments in Philadelphia and any urban center have the power to impact the health of a city. My dear friend and mentor, Jeremy Nowak, helped me understand. As a giant in urban civic engagement and urban development, he saw it another way. In the era of Amazon, Uber, Airbnb, those who adapt to meet the needs of the populace gain power. Emergency departments are accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Emergency physicians are practical fixers, many of us looking beyond the immediate needs of acute care to the world around us. I try to meet my patients where they are and work to make my interventions relevant, not only to the way they access care, but live. Slow-changing institutions continue to force people into paradigms that may not meet their needs. In taking giant steps back and considering emergency departments in the context of our world, we see they are uniquely positioned to address public health issues to impact population health, to work towards health equity, and to ultimately become tools of social justice among disparate populations in any urban center. I interpret the world through the lens of an emergency physician, but also as a public health advocate, as a member of the Philadelphia community, as the daughter of immigrants, as a wife and a mother, as a supporter of the, equal, of the fundamental rights to equal access to care. I am a believer in the power of urban resilience and social justice 
to increase and improve the future for all of us. This journey began with a simple paradigm of seeing a painting, understanding the world, and looking beyond. It continues with a deep sense of responsibility and a growing sense of empowerment. Many of us realized the cavalry may not be coming, and even if they do, they will not see what we see from the front lines of our world. It starts with us. We have the power to disrupt for greater good. We can change our world. Power belongs to the problem solvers.